for, for a person who needs it. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a great, uh, great turnout. So, so glad to see uh, all of you here uh, for, no, oh, sorry, I'm getting a text message. It might be about more chairs. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yes, there, there are more chairs on the way. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Arthur Urbano. I teach in the theology department uh, here at Providence College, and I'm also the uh, chair of the Jewish Catholic uh, Theological Exchange Committee, uh, which plans and organizes uh, these events. Um, so I welcome you tonight uh, to uh, our, our lecture in our series, Theological Exchange Between Catholics uh, and Jews. Our program is now in its uh, ninth year. Uh, and the mission of the program is to foster interreligious learning, mutual understanding, dialogue, uh, and friendship uh, by creating forums for dialogue and engagement. Uh, in short, our mission uh, is to provide opportunities for Catholics and Jews to learn about and from one another. Um, I'm especially happy to see so many students here uh, this evening. Um, and on behalf of the committee, I'd like to extend a warm welcome uh, to those of you who, are, are, who have joined us tonight from uh, beyond uh, the gates uh, of the college. Uh, your, your presence here is a testament uh, to the value and the good uh, of our semi-annual gatherings. Um, I'd like to thank our campus co-sponsors for helping to make tonight uh, possible. Uh, the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies, uh, the Graduate Program in Theology, and the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, gratitude is also owed to our faithful and generous donors, Jews and Christians, alumni, and community partners. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, I'm also grateful to the Thomistic Institute of the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. for partnering uh, with us uh, on tonight's uh, event. Uh, if you'd like to know more about our program here at the college, uh, there are brochures uh, at the sign-in table uh, where you came in. Uh, so please be sure to, uh, to grab one of those. Um, our, our website uh, is also, um, uh, the link to our website is included uh, in the brochure. Um, our topic tonight is supersessionism. Uh, perhaps it's a word that's not immediately familiar uh, to everyone, uh, but it is a concept that has shaped the Jewish-Christian relationship uh, in fundamental ways uh, since antiquity. Uh, also known as replacement theology, it is defined in a recent Vatican document as the Christian teaching that the promises and commitments of God would no longer apply to Israel because it had not recognized Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God, but had been transferred to the church, which was now the true new Israel. And thus the church superseded Israel as God's chosen people. In the 50 plus years since Vatican II and in the context of the new relationship between Jews and Catholics uh, forged by popes, rabbis, theologians, and laypeople, the theological notion of supersessionism has been revisited and rethought and debated. And as our guests will discuss tonight, in many ways it still remains an unresolved question in the Jewish-Christian relationship. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce tonight's guests, and I'm really eager for this conversation, as I know that uh, many of you are. Uh, Rabbi Dr. David Novak is the J. Richard and Dorothy Schiff Chair in Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. He received his rabbinical diploma from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, where he studied with Abraham Joshua Heschel, and his PhD in philosophy from Georgetown University. He is a founder and vice president of the Institute on Religion and Public Life and a member of the editorial board of its monthly journal, First Things. Dr. Novak is author of 18 books and over 300 scholarly articles. His latest book published in 2017 is entitled Jewish Justice. He has made pioneering contributions to the world of Jewish Christian dialogue, including his book, Jewish Christian Dialogue, A Jewish Justification, and as a co-author of Dabru Amet, A Jewish Statement on Christians and Christianity, which appeared in 2000. Father Thomas Joseph White is a friar of the Dominican Order and director of the Thomistic Institute at the Dominican House of Studies. A native of Georgia, Father White studied at Brown University, where he converted to Catholicism. He did his doctoral studies at Oxford University and is the author of several books and articles, including Wisdom in the Face of Modernity, a Thomistic Study of Natural Theology, a commentary on the book of, uh, of Exodus, published by Brazos Press, 
and his latest, The Light of Christ, an Introduction to Catholicism. He is co-editor of the academic journal Nova et Vetera, and in 2011 was appointed an ordinary member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. In September, he will be moving to Rome, where he will teach at the Angelicum and direct the Thomistic Institute there. Uh, now, before I welcome our uh, speakers, just a brief word about how uh, the, the structure of tonight's dialogue uh, will work. So each of our guests will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes uh, on the topic. Then they will spend some time um, in conversation uh, with one another. Uh, and then after that period of time, we'll open up the, um, uh, the floor to questions and invite the audience uh, to participate uh, in the dialogue. So with that having been said, uh, it's a great uh, honor for me to introduce to you uh, Rabbi Novak and Father White. We're also on the same level as the audience. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Urbano. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've never been, I've been to Providence uh, uh, on a couple of occasions, but I've never been to Providence College. So I uh, very much appreciate being here and the warm welcome that I have uh, received. Um, let, to, to illustrate uh, our, ah, okay, everybody hear me? Okay, to illustrate uh, uh, the question that we're uh, dealing with today, let me uh, tell you a little story. Uh, rabbis always begin with stories. Uh, and I think that it illustrates the point. Uh, many years ago, uh, when I was a, uh, a, a pulpit rabbi before uh, I became a full-time academic, uh, there was a woman in, in my congregation, let's call her Mrs. Cohn, uh, who told me the following story. Uh, and she was a very prominent uh, member of the community and quite learned uh, Jewishly. She and her husband were uh, coming, this was from, they lived in Norfolk, Virginia. They were taking a train to New York, and as they got off the train walking through Grand Central Station, her husband had a massive heart attack, a massive heart attack, for which he subsequently did not recover. But at that point, he was taken, they, and she, of course, went with him, to a Catholic hospital in Brooklyn. And Mrs. Cohn mentioned to me, needless to say, how distraught she was uh, uh, over her husband's heart attack. And it was clear that uh, he wasn't going to survive. And she said to one of the sisters who was uh, uh, nurse attending him, she said, my God has failed me. Perhaps your God can help. My God has failed me. Perhaps your God has helped. Which is very much a... a, a a common notion. Uh, it's very pluralistic if you think of it. In other words, you have your God, we have our God, you have your tradition, we have our tradition, and whatever. And this is exactly uh, the position uh, that most of us uh, uh, face uh, living in a largely secular, pluralistic uh, society. And I can understand what she was saying, she was quite distraught, but what she was saying is, unfortunately, just not true. Uh, the fact is, although it's been debated, and I'll talk about this a little bit, uh, that Jews and Christians worship the same God. Not only do Jews and Christians worship the same God, but they base their connection with that God on the same revelation. Uh, the same revelation is the revelation of God to the people of Israel uh, at Mount Sinai, uh, of which Jews say is fulfilled in one way, and Christians say, of course, is filled in the coming of, uh, uh, of Christ and then the final redemption, uh, uh, the return of, uh, of, of, of Christ. So therefore, one cannot say simply, you have your God and, and we have ours. And you can't even say, well, you have the same God, but kind of two different covenants. Because the covenant, which is the, the Brit, the relationship between God and a people, uh, is something uh, which we uh, both claim about ourselves. 
Now, the problem uh, of supersessionism comes in when it is accepted that we worship the same God and that we consider ourselves to be uh, participants in the same covenant uh, based upon its historical founding uh, at uh, the covenant between God and Israel at, at Mount Sinai. Uh, and therefore, one can sim not simply say, you have yours and uh, uh, we have ours. Supersessionism, supersessionism comes in two forms. And the type of supersessionism that usually goes under the name is what I would call hard supersessionism. Hard supersessionism is that God has a covenant with the people of Israel. The people of Israel uh, were sent numerous prophets and whatever, but because they did not accept Jesus of Nazareth as the, as the, 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 the Christos, the Mashiach, the, the, the Messiah, therefore God has replaced them with the, the Christian church, uh, which means that therefore, from a th the theological perspective of this type of supersessionism, uh, there is no reason for Judaism to continue to exist. It does not necessarily mean that hard supersessionists are anti-Semites. Hard supersessionists can clearly regard uh, Jews as having uh, rights like anyone else, not to be persecuted, uh, even to practice Judaism. But from their perspective, they are really no longer, in effect, God's covenanted people uh, of Israel. Now, with that kind of what I would call hard supersessionism, uh, there, it, is, there, it is impossible to have a dialogical relationship. We can have a relationship as ordinary people in society and whatever, and actually, ironically enough, a great Jewish theologian, the late Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who spent most of his time in nearby Boston, uh, basically uh, seemed to have been of that opinion. He, he basically said that, uh, that, that all religions speak, speak different languages, uh, and therefore uh, one cannot make claims about the other uh, in, in, in that way. The problem is, is that we do speak, Jews and Jews, Jews and Christians do speak the language. There is no Christian doctrine that does not have a basis in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, in the Torah. Uh, so in that way, they, one cannot simply say th th this factor, but if, if, you, if, you, if you want a dialogical relationship, in other words, where we are relating as faithful Jews and faithful Christians uh, in in, in, in that sense. It, it is simply uh, an impossibility, uh, and therefore there can be relations on a number of other levels, but it cannot be uh, what we call uh, a true interfaith uh, 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 dialogue. So that is one kind of supersessionism. There is another kind of supersessionism which I think to a certain extent is, is necessary. And that supersessionism is what I would call soft supersessionism. Soft supersessionism, uh, which one can perhaps see in the Vatican document, is clearly regards as Christians, and I think Christians have to regard this, as that they are the branch grafted onto the tree, but that uh, they have clearly fulfilled or carried further the covenant than uh, the Jewish people have. Uh, and I say soft supersessionism because the difference between soft supersession and hard supersessionism is they both recognize that the foundation of the house of this covenant is, was originally the people of Israel, uh, which by the time of Jesus become the Jewish people. Uh, and the question is, the hard supersessionist says, yes, you were on the main floor, but we've built on, on top of the main floor, and now we've displaced you even from your first floor uh, uh, residence. 
The soft supersession has said, yes, we would like the, these original uh, uh, tenants on, on the first floor to move up with us, but we're not going to displace them. We're not going to say that, therefore, uh, they've lost their right to be uh, uh, where they are. I think if you keep, kind of keep, keep that uh, metaphor in mind, it's, it, it's, it, it's helpful. Uh, but the soft supersessionist also uh, is, seems to be of the opinion that although Jews are not to be uh, uh, dis uh, you know, dismissed uh, as members uh, 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 of the covenant, uh, but it's hoped that eventually it seems to be that they will come around and that will join together and, and the church and the people of Israel will, and the Jewish people will, be, will become uh, one. But it is uh, recognized there that clearly that attempts to force, uh, and not even politically force, but even emotionally force uh, people into the covenant by saying, you know, what, what you have has simply been passe, uh, is something that is clearly a human pride, triumphalism, and whatever. It's, it's God and God's good time who will uh, uh, bring this uh, uh, about. Uh, which also means that actually in a, what we call a dialogical relationship, it's still basically uh, I uh, hoping that somehow or other in soft supersessionism that you will eventually become like me. Now, it's an easy thing for me as a non-Christian to say to Christians, you know, supersessionism, that's, that, that's your problem. That's your problem and call to their, uh, you know, uh, attention and, and whatever, whether it's hard or soft supersessionism. And by the way, one of the results of the soft supersessionism that one would see in Nostra Aetate, the, the Vatican Statement Vatican II, uh, which still needs a lot of theological work uh, uh, to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, elaborated upon, uh, uh, that if, if one, uh, you know, uh, looks at that, one of the, for Jews, the most important, the most important aspect that came practical, you know, on the ground, what difference does it make on the ground, is that the Catholic Church no longer has missions that specifically target Jews. In other words, the Catholic Church is, is, is evangelical in the sense of, you know, bearing witness, to be sure, and the Catholic Church will certainly accept uh, uh, Jewish converts, as Jews will accept uh, converts from Christian religions, okay. But the idea of specifically targeting Jews in a specific sort of way and whatever has been, for Jews, I think, the most important and gratifying uh, result of Vatican II and has enabled the dialogical relationship to, uh, to develop in the past uh, uh, 50, 60 years. Okay. So that is what one has with soft, uh, 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 supersessionism. I think that there is a certain amount of supersessionism that is not only present in Christianity, so I can say, well, you know, that's your problem. We Jews also have the same problem. And the same problem is as follows, is hard supersessionism, basically, Jews are, for the hard supersessions, the Christian hard supersessions, Jews are part of the irretrievable past. Now, they never go as far as what was declared the first heresy of the church by Marcion, basically saying that there was no Jewish basis, that the Jewish God, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. That's always something, that was the first heresy declared by the church, and that's always something even hard supersessionists have to kind of draw back from Marcionism, although it's always lurking in the background. Okay. There are Jewish heart supersessionists. Now, how can you say that Jews are supersessionists? Supersession means we came later. We superseded you. How can we say that, that Judaism superseded Christianity after it's hist their historical phenomena? You know, post hook or proper hook. You know, what comes afterwards is because of what came before. Well, in this type of heart supersessionism, it is that basically, Christians are looked upon as a throwback to the type of idolatry that was overcome beginning with Abraham 
and with the Mosaic Covenant. In other words, this is a throwback to basically the, the Canaanites, if you will, and therefore the Christians are uh, kind of uh, pre-Abrahamic idolatry redivivus, you know, kind of re revived and whatever. And indeed, one of the great debates in, in medieval Judaism was, is Christianity uh, an authentic monotheism, or is it basically uh, a, a polytheism, which is, which is the uh, ideational basis of, 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 of idolatry? And this was debated. It was debated uh, by Jews. It was debated by Muslims as well. In fact, most of the anti-Trinitarian polemics in the Middle Ages were jointly Jewish and uh, Islamic. So this is a kind of a hard Jewish uh, uh, supersessionism, which looks upon Christianity as a throwback to what Judaism in, uh, in the Torah uh, overcame. OK. Soft supersessionism is also present in the Jewish tradition. And it's basically is uh, the position that was best, I think, expressed by uh, Moses Maimonides, the, the greatest of the medieval Jewish jurist theologians, uh, had a tremendous influence on, uh, on, on Thomas Aquinas, uh, died in, in 1204. Uh, and his argument, and very interestingly, he argued, he usually seemed to prefer Islam for philosophical reasons to Christianity. But he was once asked the question, are you allowed to teach the Torah to Gentiles? Are you allowed to teach the Torah to Gentiles? And he said, Christians, yes, Muslims, no. Why? Because Muslims do not accept the Torah as the revelation of God. They say there are good parts of it, parts of revelation, but a lot of it is human uh, invention. Christians accept the Hebrew Bible as the word of God. This is the Vedic Testamentum, the, 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 old, the old law, if you will, uh, the, the Old Testament. And then Maimonides says, well, if they accept it as the law of God, so why do we have differences? And then he says, well, the problem is the Christians, we agree with them on some points, but they've gotten some, some very erroneous interpretations of the Torah. Uh, and then he says, uh, which flabbergasts many Jews, because he seems to be advocating, proselytizing, he said, and were they exposed to Jewish teachers, they would clearly understand what the proper interpretation of the Torah is, and they would come around. And he, then he says, yachzoru lemutav, they would return to their primordial good. So this is kind of a Jewish soft supersessionism. So now, you see, we have an even playing field. There's a, there's a question of hard supersessionism Christian, soft supersessionism Christian. We now have hard supersessionism uh, Jewish. And there are many Jews today, certainly many in, in, in the Orthodox Jewish world where I primarily live, who, I mean, they wouldn't use the term, but are basically hard Jewish supersessionists uh, uh, regarding Christianity as being a totally, completely other religion. So that is where one stands. I think there is a certain degree of supersessionism that at least is necessary in this world. And I want to emphasize this world. In other words, basically, Christians, I think, in good faith, have to believe that their fidelity to Jesus of Nazareth as, as the Christ brought something fulfilled, uh, aspects of the covenant that were not the case before. Because if Christians don't affirm that, and there are some Christians today who are so eager for a new relationship with Judaism that in fact they're backing into a kind of syncretism. You know, well, we're really going to be just one In this world, I don't think we can be one religion or one community for very good reasons. OK. So therefore, uh, there is this. Uh, 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 un understanding there that uh, uh, that it is something for it because if not, why not return to Judaism? And I think Jews also have to understand that clearly, clearly, uh, that we have to look upon certain. And this is also Maimonides taught this: is that Christianity is, in effect, at best for us, a diluted form of Judaism. 
In other words, it was a Judaism that was diluted for the sake of, 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 of the Gentiles and, 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 and whatever, uh, and that therefore it has value, but clearly uh, it is something that is that for Jews to become Christians would be, there's a Talmudic principle, malin bakodesh velo moridin. In other words, one goes up, one does not uh, go down. So therefore, to a certain extent, Christians have to regard Judaism as proto-Christianity, Christianity before, but it's still very much present in the world, hasn't been displaced. And Jews have to regard uh, Christians as some people who clearly that Judaism was just too good to be just for the Jews, but it had to be mediated in certain ways for uh, uh, the, larger, uh, uh, the, the larger world. That is uh, uh, the case that where, where I think that it stands, because to not do that is to indicate that there, at the most basic level, we make opposing truth claims opposing truth claims. And therefore, because there are opposing truth claims at the very source of meaning, meaning who is God, uh, uh, in, in, that in that sense, one cannot simply uh, avoid that, that difference. If you do, and you say, then you fall into a relativism where, truth claim, where religions don't make truth claims at all, and I think that that takes the whole uh, metaphysical uh, reality of both of our traditions, kind of uh, throws it out the window. So one has that kind of uh, uh, a, 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 a situation. I think that there is another form of supersessionism that indicates that clearly this is the case in this world. But in this world, this is something that I have to tell myself. I don't have to tell you uh, that I consider Judaism to be superior. I don't have to tell you that. Or you don't have to tell me Christianity is, is, is superior. That's occasionally, if you think, you know, why do I remain a Christian when there's another alternative, then you have to ask yourself that. Why do I remain a Jew when there's another alternative? But that is not the case. But I think that the question becomes what is uh, a, a, a term which could be called the eschatological horizon. The eschatology, the eschaton mean achritayamim, the end of days, is this is what we are both hoping for. It's not over yet. We're on our way to, to a journey. The question is, how high is that horizon? Is that horizon going to be something where basically one of us is going to get to the finish line first and is going to say to the other one, well, you know, we were patient with you, we waited for you, and whatever, but now it's a zero-sum game, and, you know, and we're welcoming you into the, into the field. And in fact, there, there's a Christian version and a Jewish version of that. The Christian version of it was the late uh, of Father Karl Rahner, who spoke about invisible Christians. Uh, in the Talmud, there is the view of Rabbi Yoshua, which says, that the righteous of the nations of the world who basically keep God's law even though they haven't joined the people of Israel will have a full portion with Israel in the world to come. Which means they'll be made honorary Jews. Uh, I mean, if you, if, if you look at it that way. So in that way, the zero-sum game is not a game that we play in this world with one another, although occasionally we have to say it to ourselves, but it's something when the eschatological horizon is foreseeable, is foreseeable. But there's an interesting passage, and I'm going to close with this, interesting passage, which from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 3, which is interpreted by both Paul uh, in the New Testament uh, and by the rabbis, and interestingly enough, uh, Paul, uh, the New Testament is, is an older work than the Talmud, at least literarily, uh, and, and whatever. And in fact, one can actually look at the New Testament as being the Christian version of the Talmud, the Talmud building on the Torah, and can look upon the Talmud as basically something akin to the Jewish New Testament. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, it reads like a rabbinic midrash. There's not one statement there that there's not a basis in the Hebrew Bible that it's referred back to. So anyway, but what 
what Isaiah says, and I'm going to read it in Hebrew, and I'm going to give you the usual translation, and I'm going to give you the midrash, that is the exegesis, that's both used by Paul and the rabbis, which suggests that they were drawing on a tradition that predated both of them. Ayin lo rata Elohim zulatacha yasele mechake lo. Literal translation, no eye has seen a God other than you who will do and act and benefit those who wait for him. Very messianic, who wait for God, waiting for God. So it's basically saying that you're the only God. There, there are the other gods there, but they're not, you know, they, they don't deliver, and you're the God. The way it's interpreted by both Paul and the rabbis is no eye but yours, O God, has seen what you will do for those who wait for you. No eye but God's. In other words, that the eschatical hajarajan is something that is even beyond our imagination. If it's beyond our imagination, then I would like to think that what this speaks to is that God in the end might be a hard supersessionist. He might supersede us all and indicate that not you were right and they were wrong, or we were right and they were right and you were wrong and whatever, but that there will be something which is beyond even our uh, uh, imagination, which will mean that none of us uh, waited in vain and that none of us had to or ought to have given up our true truth claims by which we live in this world. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is that working? I'd like to thank Arthur Urbano for his kind invitation to be here, and I'm deeply honored to be in an exchange with Rabbi David Novak, David Novak, who's been one of the foremost protagonists of Catholic Jewish dialogue in the world, and is a, a foremost expert in, uh, we could say, the Jewish theological tradition at large. And so it's a great honor to exchange thoughts with him. And I'd like to also thank my confers, the Dominican community, for their hospitality. I'm going to read my comments. They're about 20 minutes long as well. And they're formulated in, in some ways in response to uh, Rabbi Novak's paper, which, I mean, I read a, a, a draft version of thoughts that are very similar to what he spoke. He just said like, just now, and you, I think, I hope you see that I have some convergent perspectives. You might say, I agree with him on how we ought to disagree constructively. Um, and I have a... It's not entirely meant mischievously. I'm, I'm trying to somewhat reassign categories by my title because it's called On Good Supersessionism and the Covenant that Binds and Divides Us. Supersessionism is originally a creation of the ancient Hebrew prophets. It stems from the Torah itself and it remains essential to monotheism. Without it, both Christianity and Judaism cease to be. The Old Testament prophets from the beginning set themselves up against what they took to be the previous problematic religious confusion of the human race and claimed to offer in contrast a privileged and unique form of religious knowledge and worship, one particular to Israel, but also one universal in orientation destined for all human beings. Now that universality of the Torah is grounded most fundamentally in the biblical notion of creation, God the Creator is the unique, transcendent cause of the world, distinct from the world, but not indifferent to it, and is in fact present in all things as He who gives them their existence. The particularity of the Torah is expressed most, particularly through, most distinctively through covenant, the, the idea that God has revealed Himself to that people personally of Israel so that they might in turn relate to God in authentic knowledge and worship and organize their internal light life in this light. So both by its monotheistic notion of creation and its appeal to a unique covenant with God, the revelation given to Israel claims, in effect, to supersede the past era of human ignorance regarding the gods and all mythological cosmologies. Such ideas have evident implications even in our own historical moment. If God is both creator of all that exists and author of a true covenant with Israel, 
then human existence is not explained merely by reference to an impersonal horizon of matter, nor has human life arisen as a mere physical accident by chance from random mechanical processes. Created being is ultimately derived from uncreated personhood. God, who is the origin of the world, is personal, albeit in a numinous way that we denote by imperfect analogies. We have an author of our being. And he has given being to human persons made in his image. Even more significantly, he has manifested himself personally by grace to the people of Israel. In this case, not only is, you might say, the heart of being personalistic at its summit, because something mysteriously personal has created us and we are personal in his image, but in some way we must say the cosmos exists for persons so that they can live in communion with God. You might put it this way and say, being is ecclesial. We are created for personal communion. Now if this teaching of the Torah is true, then the supersessionism of biblical Judaism remains normative forever and long live supersessionism. However, ancient biblical Judaism is also inhabited by three internal tensions or paradoxes. And they, these leave room for or even suggest from within the inevitable possibility of Christianity. The Torah claims to deliver a privileged knowledge of who God is, but it also leaves the mystery of God still shrouded somehow in darkness like the veil at Mount Sinai. God is manifested in part as in the metaphorical images of the prophets, but also known primarily through the effects of salvation for a particular people. We call him, after all, the God of Israel, who manifests himself to that people alone. So can the God of Israel also be known by all personally? If he is the universal creator, can he also in some way be universally known to all peoples? Second, the covenant claims to have universal horizons of import. After all, Israel's descent, Abraham's descendants will bless all the nations. But it's also restricted in practice to those who are descendants of Abraham who live by the Mosaic law. How is that then of universal importance to the whole human race? Third, in the face of evil, suffering, and death, ancient Judaism rightly, and in a very profound way, developed thinking that pointed toward an eschatological era of salvation by God, which includes personal judgment and the universal resurrection of the dead. But what resolution of the end times has yet to unfold in any particular determinate way? When will we be redeemed from evil? Now against the backdrop of these internal tensions or paradoxes, the, the mystery of Christ as presented in the New Testament claims to offer resolution, or we might say decisive development. The fullness of the knowledge of God is brought to perfection by the fact that God himself has become human, revealing the inner life of Trinitarian communion, Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. The knowledge of who God is in himself illumines the human beings made in God's image as beings of knowledge and love, of word, inspirated love, made in the image of the God of the Bible, meant for universal communion of persons in the church. Second, the covenant that was restricted to the practice of the Mosaic Law is said to achieve a genuine universality in light of the death of Christ, since his atonement fulfills the law and simultaneously opens the covenant to the nations by the sacrament of baptism. And finally, the promise that God will confront evil, suffering, and death takes on a unique and unexpected form, since it is the God of Israel himself who suffers and dies as man and who is raised in, from the dead in solidarity with the human race. So the eschatological salvation of the world is inaugurated in Christ by his bodily resurrection. This event becomes the key to unlocking the prophecies of the Older Testament, and it prepares the human race for the end times to come in the ecclesial communion of sacramental life. Now, all this Orthodox Christian uh, theology that the New Testament claims, by which the New Testament claims to fulfill what was originally begun in biblical Judaism, I would argue, cannot accurately be characterized as supersessionalist. If by that we mean uh, that Christianity replaces ancient biblical Judaism, a replacement of that kind would invalidate Christianity, since according to its own internal logic, Christianity claims to originate organically from and as 
the culmination of all previous prophetic sources. In the words of Jesus in John 4.22 to the Samaritan woman, salvation comes from the Jews. More to the point, the missionary aim of traditional Catholicism is anti-supersessionalist anti in this sense by definition because the New Testament presupposes the truth of the original supersessionism I've mentioned as positive that comes from the Torah and the prophets with regards to non-revealed human religious traditions. So the church argues that the Torah has brought the new light of truth about who God is into the world fulfilled in Christ. Therefore, the Catholic Church continually seeks to bring forth faithfully the whole teaching of the Old Testament and its internal message, expanding its reach of communication to all the Gentile nations. To state things succinctly, without monotheism, there's no Trinitarian monotheism. Without the covenant of Israel, there's no intelligibility to the Church's belief in the Incarnation or the Atonement. In the second century, Marcion sought to renounce the use and authority of the Old Testament writings within the church. He's always had, somehow, disciples, whether they are very self-conscious of it or not. In response, Catholic authors such as Justin Martyr and Irenaeus provided interpretations of the Old Testament built on what they themselves inherited from the apostolic writings. They elaborated a threefold Christian distinction for interpreting Old Testament law as composed of moral, ceremonial, and judicial precepts. The moral, the moral teachings of the Old Testament are considered of perpetual significance and therefore in no way superseded, but on the contrary, intensified and extended within the Christian economy, particularly through the church's use and interpretation of the Ten Commandments. The ceremonial precepts are to be read typologically as signifying Christ, the church, and the sacraments. They are considered fulfilled and in so in some real sense, therefore, superseded by the seven sacraments of the new law. Baptism is said to fulfill, but also universalize circumcision, just as the Eucharist fulfills, but also universalizes the sacrifices of the Torah. Yet in this sense, the Christian economy has become one of sacrifice and priesthood in a way that continues the dynamic of the Old Testament in what is said to be a higher and more perfect key, replacing, but also preserving but in such a way so as to universalize, since baptism and the other six, six sacraments that are available now allow a way for all Gentile nations to enter the covenant. The judicial precepts, for example, around civic punishments and rewards and such, pertain to customs of a given cultural time and place, and they are considered dignified, but not necessarily universal in application, since the civic ordinances of ancient Israel are not applicable, applicable to all cultures. In addition, the second century authors also identified an what they called an anagogical sense of scripture. As Irenaeus notes, the Old Testament prophets signify many truths about the eschatological life of the world to come. So therefore, the Old Testament continues to instruct the church in what is not yet perfectly manifest. And in all these ways, then, the Older Testament is an inexhaustible resource of revealed truth, one that continues to give light to the nations until the end of the ages. That's just Catholic theology. Now, none of what has been said thus far addresses directly the question of the Catholic Church's view of the status of the Jewish people after the time of the coming of Christ, those who practice what we might call post-biblical Judaism and who do not believe in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. We should acknowledge from the beginning that um, uh, historically, many members of the Catholic Church have treated the Jewish people atrociously, not in all times and places, but in some times and places, in remarkably um, despicable ways. And sometimes this treatment has been allied with a particular theology, albeit not one officially canonized by the Catholic Church, even though it may have been in some times and places popular or customary. Now, supersessionism, as is commonly employed in this discussion, is defined as the view that the living Jewish people after the coming of Christ are no longer a people related to or in covenant with God due to the reality of the new covenant of grace and the church. Is that the case? Despite the ambiguities of the historical treatment of the Jews on the parts of some members of the Catholic Church, when she has formulated an answer to this question decisively, the church has answered by appeal to a set of traditional perennial principles. Romans 9 through 11 teaches unambiguously that after the, that 
after the coming of Christ into this world, God remains faithful to his covenant with the Jewish people, including those who do not believe in Jesus as the Christ. As Paul notes, God does not abandon them, and in fact, their continued existence remains of universal religious import to all the world, including the church. Since their eventual reconciliation with Christians will have eschatological significance, signaling the end times. And correspondingly, Catholic doctors like Augustine and Aquinas underscore that the continued existence of the, in the world of the Jewish people constitutes a perpetual sign of the reality of the ancient covenant and a sign of eschatological hope in God's plan to redeem the world. There are fundamental precedents then in the classical tradition for what one finds in the Second Vatican Council on this topic. Nostra Etate rightly excludes various erroneous theological opinions rejecting the idea that the Jewish people are either a collectively reprobate or deicide people. What it promotes positively has clear precedent in the tradition that the Jewish people continue to be beloved by God for the sake of their ancestors and that the covenant of God with Israel remains unbroken. It is erroneous to think that this teach of this teaching as being in utter rupture with the pre-conciliar past of the Catholic Church, whether one does so as a detractor of the Council or as its enthusiastic adherent. Where the teaching of Nostra Aetate and its subsequent spiritual tone are more novel, especially as expressed in the interpretations of the Second Vatican Council by Pope John Paul II, are in its condemnation of personal contempt for the Jewish people and in its advance of relations of common friendship with the Jews. This condemnation of the teaching of contempt is meant to apply both to theological and modern secular anti-Semitism. This change in tone is of course a reaction in the 20th century to the gravely horrible and evil event of the Shoah. But it also constitutes a judgment on the history of Christian mistreatment of the Jewish people, especially at various times and places in the high Middle Ages and in early modernity. Only the suffering and death of one Jew can save us, and that death has already taken place. The killing or torture or unjust political treatment of Jews by Christians does not redeem the world. To think that it could do so in terms of Christian Orthodox theology itself is a sign of the Antichrist. But what is the theological basis for this new emphasis in the, under the regime of John Paul II and so forth on Christian kindness towards Jews, which we find articulated in the mid-20th century. How might that be justified theologically? Not by appeal to neo-modernist ideas, but by appeal to something more challenging and perhaps more threatening to the Catholic Church, the teaching of Christ himself, specifically with regards to the commandment to love others in charity. Indeed, the most challenging of teachings that the Christian people or any people have ever received. Against the diverse traditions of anti-Semitic contempt, the Church insisted at Vatican II on the spiritual reality of the love of Christ crucified who died for Jews and Gentiles alike, and whose love, according to Christianity, truly definitively supersedes all other human priorities. As St. Paul tells us, the love of Christ compels us. This mandate to love, to the love of one's neighbor, with whom one can have genuine personal friendship even while disagreeing theologically, and whom one can love in the grace of Christ is of, of preeminent significance for the church. The church and the synagogue are able to speak to one another through the course of history, animated by shared eschatological expectations to which Rabbi Novak made allusion. The church being led in the course of this conversation by charity, love for the truth about God and love of one's neighbor simultaneously. Ultimately, and these are my, my concluding remarks, Christians have commitments to the Torah and the prophets of the Old Testament, principally, if you think about it, evidently, because of Jesus Christ. It is he, above all, who divides Christians and Jews, but also, paradoxically, who unites us. A Christ without biblical Judaism is unintelligible. But without Christ, the Gentile world would not be able to receive the light of the Torah as a light for all the nations. By him, those nations are bound to the roots of the covenant. The universal light of the Torah, however, continues in real history to pass through the mediation of the cross and to shine forth through the sacramental life and teaching of the church. 
The church confesses that Jesus is Lord. In doing so, she reverently employs the holy name of God revealed to Moses and applies it to Christ himself. God reveals himself to Israel as I am he who is, the creator and savior of Israel. But this name is also only intelligible for the church in light of the incarnation of this same God of Israel, the word made flesh, manifested as the crucified and risen Lord. The God of Israel has saved us in this cruciform way. This is what binds the Gentiles to the Jews. Now note I say binds, not merely unites. It is the unity of a divine commission, one that implies duties and responsibilities, not mere options. The commandment of the cross is a commandment of love and reconciliation. The cross truly can function in real history to unite Gentiles and Jews, whether one it believes it should, as Christians of de indeed must, or whether one believes it ought not to, as many Jews down through time continue to wonder or suspect. The cross does promote a kind of supersession, but it is the supersession of divine love and the profound spiritual peace that it brings. And anything that claims to speak in the name of the cross and does not bring charity or peace speaks wrongly. Love is a love of persons. If the church is truly to be a light to the nations, the church is truly to be a light to the nations. She must also be a light to that nation that is Israel. This is only possible if the original people of God, the people of Abraham, are also particularly beloved of the church in the fullness of her commitment to the truth of Christ, but also in the fullness of the respect of mutual friendship animated by a love that stems inexorably from the side of Christ. Thank you very much. So we'll take some time to maybe ask questions of each other or react to what we've talked. Yeah, let, let, let me raise the, uh, the following question. Um, is, is Christianity really a more universal religion than Judaism? Um, I mean, first of all, the statement, you know, when, when God says to Abraham, I will make you, you know, a, a father of many nations. It's interesting that the term goyim, which in the Hebrew Bible means nations, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, their first translation becomes ethnoi, which become individual Gentiles. It's a big difference. It means that basically this was the name that individual Gentiles who want to be join the people of Israel are welcomed as gerim, as welcomed as 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 as, 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 as converts. And so, in that sense, I mean that yes, if Christianity came. Uh, to bring the message of, of Sinai to, uh, uh, to, to, to the nations of, uh, of the world, uh, it was not by going, it was not by its becoming part of the nations, it was bringing the nations into, uh, or, or Gentiles into the covenant. And also, uh, if one is going to, you know, do this, uh, the kind of universalistic thing, first of all, Jews accept converts, and baptism is a, a Christian version of what Jews call tefillah, which is, means immersion uh, in a body of water, uh, which is the way converts become uh, a, a, a part of Judaism. But just, and I, I, I hope I'm not uh, being irreverent, it seems to me that it's a somewhat difficult statement about universalism that the, that the Lord God creator of the universe should choose to become incarnate in the body of a Jewish carpenter from Galilee uh, doesn't sound bad. It seems to me that Buddhism would be much more universalistic than either Christianity or, uh, or, or, or Judaism. So, uh, and the, the, the question also is that to look upon Christians as kind of carrying this uh, uh, messages that was only for this one people, you know, to, to, to the rest of the world, plays in uh, to what I would call Jewish soft supersessionism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically here, if, they, the, if the Gentiles really want the covenant, you know, a uh, hundred proof, so to speak, uh, 
you know, they'll be with us, but you will take it and, uh, 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 you know, dilute it in, 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 in that way. I, I don't think that that is uh, the case. I think that just as, uh, uh, you know, Jews didn't remain behind, you know, with the Hebrew Bible and Christians went on with the, you know, the New Testament, the New Testament and the Talmud are two traditions that are based upon the Hebrew Bible, which at times make common claims, at times make different claims. That's what makes the dialogue interesting and not a monologue or, or an antelogue, you know, uh, to talking against one another. So, I mean, in, in, in that sense, I uh, look upon that, and I think that one of the problems with that is that Christians in our culture today, in our Western culture, are going through an incredible culture shock. The credible culture shock is that Christians, for even when I was growing up, assumed that the culture was Christian. Yeah, everybody wasn't going to church, but somehow or other, we were, even if the United States was not officially a Christian nation, it, de jure, de facto, it was. And now, you have a situation where, at least at the levels of high culture, universities where I work, the media, the courts, Christians are as much a minority as Jews. When I taught at the University of Virginia in the American South, uh, evangelical students uh, who felt very, very marginalized there, because the University of Virginia was actually the first secular university in, founded by Thomas Jefferson, they would come to my office and pour their hearts out, how they felt marginalized, how they, they were ridiculed and whatever, and when they finally came up for air, you know, uh, that these, you know, pouring forth their hearts, I would say to them, you know, you sound like Jews. I said, they said, we feel like Jews. I said, well, now we got something to talk about. <laughs> in other words, so the whole notion that in this world, I mean, this might be the, 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 the ultimate charge, but the, the, the whole world that the, is, with which you had the notion, you know, in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, uh, that somehow the world's because the, the inhabited world, the Akumene is becoming more and more Christian uh, and, and whatever, and the nations are coming in, uh, is something that is uh, no longer the case. So we are both universal in the sense that yes, what we think we have is for all mankind, but I would say that it is much more that God will bring in them into the covenant, whether it's our version of it or your version of it, uh, in, in God's good time, and that in an, in an attempt to what Jews call dochake kates, to kind of force the end, is something that I think has, has, has led to uh, a, a, you know, some very tragic uh, uh, situations. And, and, and finally, one last thing, and I, I, and, and I, it, I, I very deeply appreciate that Christians recognize that there was a good deal of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism in, in their past, and, and there have been magnificent efforts to overcome this. It was largely because Christians after Constantine had political power over Jews. And I'm not so naive about my own people that if it had been, the shoe had been on the other foot, we would have probably, uh, in some ways perhaps, uh, done the same thing. So I, I'm happy that uh, uh, Christians realize that this is something in, the, in their past that needs to be superseded and overcome, but I don't think that Christian guilt over past Christian injustices to Jews is a very good basis for uh, a dialogical relationship. I think that there's much more positive uh, uh, stuff on the table for us. Thank you, David. That, that's very helpful. I, the first thing, I just let me respond to the last comment first. I mean, I, I hope my comments are not construed as trying to build the consensus around, uh, I mean, guilt, although it's sometimes uh, can, you know, realistic to assess one's own or other people's lives in terms of guilt, and it can have positive effects, it's never something ultimately as a, a, a fundamental foundation of one's personality that you build around or about an institution. So, I mean, if the church were to build um, her identity around a guilt relationship with the Jewish people, that would not succeed in lasting, and I don't want to be taken as, as thinking that myself. Um, I do think acknowledgement in an age of historical forgetfulness and also 
uh, an attempt to talk about what is, in, in Catholicism, this is an important exercise about talking what is of perennial significance and is, remains unchanged teaching or developing teaching out of, uh, out of perennial principles versus things that are uh, contingent and can be let go of. And some forms of you know, theological rhetoric around the Jewish people have to be let go of. And some of the church's teachings around uh, its own view of the Jewish people must be held on to. And so part of what I'm trying to do is, is a, an exercise in that kind of reflection. Going back to what you, so I mean, a, a kind of more general comment about your, your statements about universalism. I mean, I think sometimes we can agree on what we disagree about, and sometimes I think we're going to disagree on what we disagree about. And that's okay. That's, what, that's going to happen in, in a religious discussions and discussions between Catholics and Jews. It's not threatening. I think on the, the sort of idea of what God's doing in the church in, as a universe, the whole idea that the church is Catholic, i.e. universal, it's in the very identity of the church to consider itself a uniquely universalistic vessel for the um, conveyance of divine revelation. So I think we're probably going to end up disagreeing about what we disagree about. But let me mention, make a few comments. I mean, I do think it's very important that Christians understand theologically about Judaism that Judaism is not a race. And that racialist attempts to talk about Judaism are already just factually misbegotten. It can be, there are many people who are of diverse races who are, are Jewish. That being said, the, as it were, what we would call the, the sacraments of the old law or the, the rituals of conveyance of Jewish identity pass historically often and frequently through being born into uh, a Jewish family and of a Jewish mother and passing through uh, ritual circumcision and so forth. Now I understand that you're saying there's a logic that permits within Judaism uh, conversion to Judaism and therefore in principle it could be a, a uh, you know, a, a a much more institutionally, and in principle is, a, a, an institutionally aggressive missionary religion. It, it, there are historic reasons that Christians have, and Muslims have kept it from being so. But that being said, I do think it contracts more around conveyance through birth into a Jewish family. And because of that, it's not a race, but it is, uh, it does tend to mean that it works through a different mechanism than baptism. It's pretty difficult if you go on knock on the door of most Orthodox rabbis to become Jewish. At least they put you through your paces. It's not very difficult to be baptized. Um, and the, the historical uh, ex expression of that is that you've had all, all this, you know, sort of, I would say universalistic, multinational spread of the church um, with a high concentration of unity. I think Catholic, now you mentioned the sort of paradox, what sometimes called the scandal of the incarnation, that one human being is said to be God, and therefore that you've got this very particular, um, this Jewish particularism, you might say, in the heart of Catholicism. This is true. I do think this is um, a point of potential, independently of the differences we have about the person of Jesus, this is a point of per a potential uh, convergence I find in thinking about Catholicism with regards to Judaism versus Protestantism in some respects because Catholicism takes from Judaism what I would consider the idea that uh, religiosity is very much an embodied practice and that therefore to be a religious person in a serious way is not just to practice the mind or the will or the heart or attitudes or, or even decisions but of what you do with your body corporeally, and it involves ritual, and it involves incarnation in the broader sense of the term. And so the church always lives in this kind of paradox between insisting on the particularity of like the local parish, the sacrament that makes God present among us in this mass, uh, the presence of Christ as a historical human person, a historical uh, presence of, of God in a human nature, and at the same time, the sort of uh, universal importance of this, because all of us have bodies, all human beings need to live in a particular way. It's like, it's like the universal significance of marriage. I mean, it, it, people get married in every culture, but they only get married to one particular person. And so there's a kind of way in which the individual expression of embodiedness uh, is really something everyone is, it's part of everyone's life or every culture. I think from the logic of Judaism internally, Catholicism has taken this notion of embodiment. And so, yes, it's a point of division, the incarnation. It's also a dynamic of value of like, that God would care about our particular lives in history of this people at this time, in these details, in this embodiment, 
which I think Catholicism maintains in a very deep way in its own sacramental life and devotion. Um, Dechristianization, yeah. I certainly don't think the universal horizons of Catholicism or the universal aspirations of its missionary drive should be equated with uh, its influence in civ any particular civic government or its ascendancy or descendancy in Europe and America at this time. There is no question we're passing through a massive time of dechristianization in Europe and I think it, it's accelerating greatly in, I mean, the, 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 the studies show it's accelerating greatly in young adults in their 20s in, in America at unprecedented rates. That's a fact. And Jonathan Sachs, who's uh, also a, you know, a rabbi of uh, great theological merit, uh, spoke at First Things uh, Erasmus lecture a few years ago and talked about the, the challenge of being a religious creative minority in a secular culture at large today. And he was saying to Catholics and to Christians that this is something that Jews have known about for a long time that Christians can learn from. How to be a creative minority in a culture that maybe despises or doesn't understand Christianity. I absolutely agree with him that there's a great deal the church can learn from Orthodox Jews about how to be faithful to your tradition, to accept not to be mainstream, maybe to be misunderstood or despised, and at the same time to believe that you have a message of universal import. But I do think that Catholicism in its DNA aspires to... Uh, always uh, create a culture, a culture of Christianity that's artistic, intellectual, political. Uh, it can have very different variations. It can exist in a modern secular democracy, but it always attempts to put down cultural roots of a universal extension. And I think that's just part of the sort of nature and logic of Catholicism. Yeah, just, just two points, and then I, I think we really should uh, open it up to uh, uh, the audience. Um, the idea is that, well, somehow something is, is born into, in, in, into the Jewish people, um, and therefore it makes it kind of particularistic. Um, first of all, uh, conversion is in the New Testament called anagenesis, which means rebirth, and in the Talmud, it's called Gershinit Geyer Kakachan Shinola Dami, that the one who converts becomes like a child again. And in fact, coming out of the water is really in some ways symbolic of coming out of the womb. Uh, uh, but the fact is, yes, and you know better than I the, uh, the patristic statement, Christianos non nasiter sed fiat, a Christian is not born but made. But if, and I know in your case it wasn't because you converted as an adult, but if a Christian Many Christians, or mostly Catholic, but some Protestant as well, were baptized at three weeks old, and you say baptism is indelible, then you were as much born into the Catholic Church as I was born into the Jewish people. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, uh, there were great debates in the, Mid in the Middle Ages, I've, 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 I've written on this, is when a Jew uh, left the community and... Uh, converted to some other religion, whether Christianity or Islam, and then they wanted to return. Uh, there were many rabbis who said there should be no ritual whatsoever because they never really left, metaphysically. De facto they left, but de they left. And eventually they worked out a purification ritual, but it was not a reconversion because you, in the metaphysical sense, could, could, could uh, uh, not leave. So that also becomes a factor. The last factor is when people talk about a light to the nations. It appears three times in Deuter Isaiah, the second part of the book of Isaiah. And the Hebrew actually is not a light to the nations. It is or goyim. It is the light of the nations. What does it mean? It does not mean that the people of Israel are commanded to take their light and spread it all over the world. It means that the nations of the world, when they recognize what God is doing for the people of Israel through their Torah observance, through the reestablishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, that many of the Gentiles will be very impressed and think that this is really what humanity was meant to be. So it's not light to the nation, carrying the light to the nations, but it's seeing what God's light on the people and their life is doing that is attractive. And the last point is, yes, there are many rap Orthodox rabbis who are very uh, unwelcoming of converts. 
Uh, some of that is changing. There, uh, uh, there are a number of rabbinic courts now uh, that clearly want to distinct, you know, make sure that we're not dealing with, uh, uh, you know, religious dilettantes, but that the people who sh express the sincerity. There's one here who uh, lives here in, in Providence, whom I know. Uh, and it's certainly uh, a question of, uh, of a welcoming, and not that is uh, that that that's not not necessarily the uh, uh, the case. Okay, Dr. Urbano, I think. Uh, right. I think um, at at this point we can, uh, if uh, there are questions from the uh, from the audience. So there's a mic on either side, as you can see. Um, I know it's a little tight in the room, so I can also play Phil Donahue and, and run around with, with the microphone a bit. But if you, want to, if you have questions and want to make lines at the, uh, at the mics, and I would invite any, any students first, to give students first dibs here um, for any questions for um, uh, either or both of our speakers. Don't be shy. Yes. Oh, yes. First, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. and, and doing this conversation. It was a joy to listen to. Um, Father, the, okay, supersession of divine love as opposed to, you know, like the softer, hard supersession that Rabbi was talking about. What do we make of the statement about salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ? Like, can you just talk about a reconciliation between what you were talking about and that statement a little bit explicitly? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, so the question is, what ought we? How can the thoughts I was giving be paired with the teaching of the New Testament that salvation comes through faith in Christ? Um, so, in some ways, all I was doing in my talk was um, treating the question of whether it is possible for Catholics to speak about the Jews as being superseded by the Church and answering negatively and saying that we share actually common supersession. In the longer version of this paper, I talk about how we can cooperate in, in the midst of our disagreements on uh, spreading the truths, including truths of the Torah, uh, universally in the kind of collaboration. Now, you also have important questions in Catholic theology of the Jewish people about the status of the ongoing practice of the Jewish law by you might call it post-biblical Jews who are not Christians, and the questions about the possibility of salvation for non-Christians in general, and of the Jews in particular, in light of the teaching that all salvation comes through the grace of Christ. And the modern Catholic, well, the Catholic Church traditionally teaches that it's possible for people who are not baptized to be acted upon by the grace of Christ and to be saved by God, and this can occur sometimes, we would say, despite or in spite of uh, the lack of awareness of a truth about the mystery of God revealed in Christ. Um, the normal qualification to place here is that it, it matters greatly whether the person is in a state of invincible ignorance or whether the person has uh, come to an awareness of the truth aforementioned. It also has to be thought about a little bit, I think, sociologically in light of the churches, well, I mean, if you take a person who is raised in Saudi Arabia today, who may have not some knowledge of Christianity, but like what real knowledge is there? You have the questions of the person's uh, conscience, conscientious, sincere convictions, the work they've done to find, find the truth. And ultimately, I mean, God is the judge, the sovereign judge of the conscience, which we aren't, which may mean that people are culpable for rejecting the truth in ways we don't know, but it could also mean they're not culpable for not holding to the truths of the Catholic faith that we have been graced to, to discover. And I think the what changed in the 19th, well, it started already the discovery of the Native American populations in South America and North America. We had large swaths of people who'd never heard of Christianity in the 16th century and so forth and discovering them. But in the modernity, I mean, the church tried to, I think, is nuance or come to, it's not that she's rejected her previous teaching, but the development was to recognize with greater nuance the kind of complex sociology of how people come to religious recognition or the way they make, they formulate truth convictions. Okay, so the church does place a lot of emphasis on 
respect for the subjectivity of people while holding to the objective truth of Christ and claiming that all grace comes through Christ. And this is one of the ways we approach the question of the... I mean, it is no question that many of our Jewish brothers and sisters are deeply, sincerely convicted. They have the ancient roots of the covenant to which they hold fast in fidelity sometimes, despite uh, often important historical opposition. And so... Uh, in many cases, I think we have to respect the integrity of their commitment and wonder if with Paul in Romans 9 through 11, God's grace is at some way in work in their strong conviction of the necessity of remaining faithful to the covenant that they have received. I don't think we should try to pronounce on their salvation. I don't think we should try to pronounce, but I think we can think about conditions that are specific to them. And that's very different if we think about how God might save someone who's a Buddhist or for that matter, a Muslim. I think we do need to think about that without ever trying to make pronouncements about particular persons. First of all, are there any students who be, should be before me? Yes. Hi, how are you guys? Hi. I just have a question. Um, whether you think that um, furthering this dialogue should either faith release kind of a statement that was released during the Second Vatican Council, or do you think there's still a lot of things to get through from what was released during the Second Vatican Council with um, Nostra Aetai, however you say that, sorry. Well, you know, in, in the year 2000, I, I was one of the four authors of a statement called Dabro Emet, Speak the Truth, which is a Jewish statement on Christianity. And the reason we wrote it was, and we state this in the, in the preface, uh, is that the Catholic Church in Nostra Aetate and some of the uh, evangelical uh, communions uh, issued major statements on the Jews that, that really required a great deal of rethinking and, uh, uh, and, and, and creative thinking in the best sense of the term. And uh, one of the, gr the, the, the great things uh, about uh, Jewish Christian and specifically Jewish Catholic dialogue was in the early days, and you can understand it, it was primarily at the diplomatic level. Uh, it was, you know, we're, we're living in this post-war world and, and whatever, and that was very good. What came to a point, and it was what point when I was his student, when I was in 1965, when my late revered teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, was called to Rome where he had a secret meeting with Pope Paul VI, uh, and also a series of incredible discussions with Cardinal Bea, and what did they discuss? What did they discuss, these two theologians? They did not discuss good relations. They did not discuss the question, should they recognize the state of Israel or what? I mean, all those are important things. But what they discussed was, basically, and I was his student at the time, and I remember him coming back from Rome. They discussed the similarity of Jewish and Christian interpretations of the Song of Songs, which is read as an allegory of God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church. In other words, they began at the very, very highest theological level. Uh, and that is one of the things that I have found uh, uh, invigorating. Jewish theology as a live option today has greatly, greatly benefited from these kind of conversations with theologians of uh, the caliber of Father Thomas Joseph. Uh, uh, and that is something that somehow or other the hand of God is uh, at work. Whether the end is near or not, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there is something brewing there. And where it comes out also is, you know, when we talk about moral agreement, and to, to, tomorrow morning we're going to have a session on Aquinas on the old law, where, uh, you know, which is a great area of commonality uh, of Jews, especially the moral precepts of the Hebrew Bible. It used to be thought, you know, in a kind of secular world, well, we don't need all of this uh, theological baggage and whatever. Let's just talk about good relations and human beings being decent to one another. Well, what we're discovering in the secular or secularist world is that there's a notion of the human person out there 
that is very, very different. We say that the human person is imago dei, which means the person is created in the image of God, that human beings are capable, at least that's the way I interpret it, of a unique and direct relationship with God. Uh, and that is something that characterizes human beings. You know, people say, what, what different, you know, we, biology, what difference does it make of the human being and animals? We know animals have emotions and whatever. Human beings, as far as I know, are the only creatures who worship. Who worship. When you're talking about this notion of the human person, and that therefore there are different notions of the human person, there are different notions of the human person out there, then we get this disagreement about abortion and euthanasia and, and, and marriage and all of that. So therefore, this, this theologically grounded anthropology of what a human being is, is very much at the heart of our moral commonality. And it's not something that can be separated and severed from its theological roots. And there is a tremendous amount of work that we uh, 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 can do together, both theoretically and very practically as well. Uh, may I just add briefly, I think that the more the culture dechristianizes, the more that the reference to the anthropology and moral teachings of the Torah are going to become extremely important in uh, Christianity, and that the commonality between Jews and Christians will emerge as more forceful and important. I, I do think it answers the question that uh, the, the tasks of Catholics thinking theologically about Jews and including about the state of Israel are still very underdeveloped. I mean, there's, there's initiations, there's intimations of where things could go, but a lot more work needs to be done before the magisterium makes more developed pronouncements. And the other partner, it's different, it's a very different situation, but the other tradition where there's almost no really strongly developed reflection in Catholicism, but that affects the way we talk with Jews is in our reflection on Islam. And it's of massive importance. It's completely neglected, really. We don't have the courage to say things about it publicly, it's cra which is, a, I think, a disaster. And I think Catholics need to think much more constructively about the analysis of Islam and how our relationship with Islam differs fundamentally from our relationship with Judaism. And that's not to detract from our relationship with Muslims, but it's actually to help us understand how we ought to relate a better relationship to the Jews and the uniqueness of that relationship helps us understand better how differently and therefore constructively we can relate to Muslims. Well, I, I think I would add to that this, this, this is true and uh, uh, in the sense that Jews and Christians share a common book. It's called the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. With Muslims, we do not share a common book. We do not share a common revelation. That's a big, big difference. So that, for example, when Matthew Levering, a, a, a distinguished Catholic theologian, who's a very good friend of both Father Thomas Joseph and myself, uh, and I wrote a book with a Muslim colleague on natural law, a Jewish Christian and Islamic trilogue, in that book we realized that it's a mistake to talk about the three Abrahamic religions and religions of the book. The book is, 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 is different for Jews and Christians than it is for, for Muslims. So we talked about the problem of law. In other words, the problem of natural law is how do three, let's face it, particularistic traditions uh, say that certain moral norms are presupposed by these traditions. In fact, Thomas Aquinas even uses the term presupposition uh, 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 in that. And how do they do it, not given by the authority of our tradition, but still not something that also leads us into a kind of a vapid universalism. So the, you're absolutely right. In other words, the notion of a trilogue is the trilogue cannot be the type of theological dialogue that Jews and Christians have. Jews and, and Christians have a very different relationship with Muslims. It should be developed, but it should not be just, let's take in, let's, let, let's turn a, a duality into a trinity. Yes, I'm next. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Rabbi Novak for rejecting a guilt-based dialogue. You don't, that is a great load off the conversation. Uh, earlier versions of this have centered on how violent act it is to write, to, to scrawl swastikas on synagogues. It is a vile and disgusting act, but doesn't take you very far to realize that. Sort of elementary gentlemanless, gentlemanliness is enough to reject that. Uh, but actually, I, that's not my question. 
Uh, father invited me to ask difficult questions, and I will. Uh, exactly what do you make of Islam? Around Wheaton College, it's considered heresy to say that Christians and Muslims, I guess Jews and Muslims as well, worship the same God. That seems just to be false. Uh, Allah is the creator of the universe. Allah speaks through Abraham, uh, and so on. Uh, but that doesn't, so we say, take us very far. Uh, it's, you know, if we get past demonizing Muslims, which is common enough these days, we still have awful lot of questions about how Christians and how Jews should understand Islam. And I'd like you to spell out your thoughts on that topic. <laughs> Who'd you address that to? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, let, me say, let me say a couple of very brief things. I mean, in, my, in the larger paper, I have a section on Islam. I also talk about a different kind of supersessionism. I think Islam is a supersessionist movement with regards to Christianity and Judaism. Sure. And I think also, you might call it Hegel's interpretation of Christianity and Judaism is a form of enlightenment, secular supersessionism that thinks that the secular liberal ethos should supersede the, the, the ethos of Christianity. Um, Got it from Spinoza. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think with regards to Islam, you have interesting parallels. There are elements of it that seem more Jewish. There are elements of it that seem more Christian. And there's elements in it that reject both uh, alike. Um, I mean, I think the key thing is that because it, 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 it eradicates all, and I think this is one of its advantages culturally, but also one of its tragic problems is it eradicates all other mediations of prophecy than the prophecy given to Muhammad enshrined in a book, which is not the Old or New Testament, and which is also teaching you from within the Quran that both the Old and New Testament contain effectively erroneous prophecy and uh, have to be superseded and rejected. And because of its monolithic nature, uh, it, the, I mean, as Rimi Bragg, who's a French specialist of Islam, said, the, the, the tragic irony is Muslims think they know what both Jews and Christians are from reading the Quran, but because they read the Quran, they don't know Judaism or Christianity well. And we don't know, in our turn, he said, what exactly to make of them, because uh, they're not a natural religion or a religion of reason, as it were. Uh, they claim to have historical revelation, but they claim that over and against the Jewish idea that Abraham was chosen and that his lineage passes through Isaac and through the people of Israel in Jerusalem, and they relocate that through the Arab people and Mecca and the, you know, sacral book of pre-existent Arabic. Um, so there are ways in which the Catholic Church can't go back, can't re, can't, speaking about three Abrahamic religions, it seems to me, is a catastrophe. Uh, Islam is not an Abrahamic religion in the strong sense of the world, word. It, in, it alludes to him, but it also reinterprets him, just as it reinterprets Jesus in so radical a way as to disfigure who Jesus is. And so what you're talking about is a kind of a, uh, I mean, the classical word is not a disrespectful one. It's a, mis a partially mistaken teaching. It's what John de Damascene called it. It's a heresy. And that's actually in many ways a compliment. That means it contains truths that are from Judaism and Christianity. But it also sends us back to the fundamental question of where does it, the revelation originate? The revelation originates with the Jews, not with the Quran. And if we can't articulate that both historically and rationally in defending the historicity of the Jewish people in antiquity, the, Jewish, the historicity of the writings of the Old Testament, then we can't really answer Judea, uh, is, we can't respond to Islam in a sophisticated historical way as well as in terms of the roots of our own ethics our understanding of the image of God, which, by the way, is a notion rejected in Islam and is thought to be offensive that man is made in the image of God mm -hmm. because it makes man too much like God and it is way too presumptuous and it's quasi idolatrous. <coughs> right, so that there's huge differences that Christians cannot understand if they don't understand well their Jewish heritage. Just one, one, one point, a more... Uh historical point one, one of the I, and I agree I think the notion of Abrahamic religions is uh, does, doesn't get you very far uh, uh, I think that you can say that Jews and Christian and Islam are three religions of revelation 
uh, but that Jews, Judaism and Christianity share a revelation that is not shared by, by, by Islam. One of the other factors that, that, that's true, especially in the West, is, look, Jews and Christians, including Jewish and Christian theologians, went through the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. And we came out of it like Jacob and the angel, uh, still there but limping. Uh, and uh, th that's a factor. I mean, I think it's a, it, it's a kind of a crucible that we all had to go through. Uh, Islam in, did not go through it. So therefore, when you talk theology uh, with Muslims, you're talking about a Muslim theology that basically, uh, for all intents and purposes, still using a, a, a language of, of, of the 14th century. Uh, and that's the thing. When you talk law with Muslims, law, Muslims have tremendous experience with law and states and whatever. That's in very invaluable. That is why uh, with Matthew Levering and Andre Iman, we t t touched on the question of law rather than the question of strictly, in other words, the lex naturalis rather than the lex novena uh, in, in, in that sense. So this is the case, and I, I mean, there, there are clearly, the, but, but pointing out that the dialogue cannot become a trialogue at least at a strictly theological level. At a more philosophical level, when you deal with law, which has theological, in, 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 in form, it's informed by theology to be sure, that's a different story, but it's, it is, a, um, uh, I remember when we wrote uh, the statement in, 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 in 2000, a colleague of mine said, um, uh, when it, well, when are you going to write a statement about Islam? I said, uh, uh, this is not a course in comparative religion. Uh, one of the reasons of the Jewish-Christian relationship and its depth now is because Jews and Christians now in the West have an even political playing field. One does not have the kind of power over the other, where, like the medieval disputations, where Jews basically had to justify why they were still Jews. We don't have that. Look at the world today in terms of realpolitik. We, there is not that uh, even playing field. Hopefully, God willing, uh, if, if, it, if it happens, then, the, then it will be a different story. But there's a political presupposition to effective dialogue. We are political beings, as Aristotle said. We live in societies, we live in communities, there's, there's a, 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 a real politic that's going on, which is also, we're theological, we're both oriented uh, to the world, we're both oriented to God. And in that sense, then one has to understand not only what we base ourselves on and what we don't base ourselves on, but what is the zitzim leben, what is the situation in the world today that has to be taken into consideration as a precondition for uh, a dialogue. You can't have a dialogue with people who basically uh, are not recognizing the reality in which they're living. Let me just suggest in the interest of time and in the interest of getting to the remaining questions that if we, it's getting late, but, but let, let's um, continue the discussion a little bit and, and maybe we can do a sort of a speed round with um, uh, <laughs> quick questions and, and answers just so that we can get to, get to the question. So, Gentlemen across the room. Uh, so when the rabbi made the opening statement, I detected a sense of black and white fallacy in the mention of the hard and soft uh, supersessionalism. Yeah. Could you elaborate on the great divide between the two faiths? Could I elaborate on what I didn't uh, get you? The two faiths, the supersessionalism. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, f f f first of all, yes, I mean, they are two different and at times common. You can't be totally different, you can't be totally common totally different, you're t different universes, totally common, you have a monologue. Uh, but it is the same covenant, and I think that one of the things that um, is helpful is when you talk about the New Testament or the New Law or the New Covenant, in Hebrew it's Brit Chadasha. Chadasha does not mean new in the sense of innovative, it means renewed. King Saul, you remember, they come and renew the kingship. They renew it. The covenant is regularly renewed. And I think that Christians were saying that. They're saying, we're not bringing something foreign into it. We're renewing it. We're, we're, we're carrying it forward. Something new has happened uh, for Christians. Christ has come and lived and died and, res and resurrected as Christian teaching teaches. It. And therefore, that definitely, uh, the covenant just does re remain at, at, at its origins. And to understand 
that Christianity did not build upon Judaism. Judaism and Christianity are two traditions that built upon the Hebrew Bible and some little parts of Second Temple Judaism. But most of the Judaism that we recognize today, rabbinic Judaism, developed pretty much at the same time the New Testament celebrated. So, so it is not a question of building on Judaism. Both of them build on the revelation that was given to ancient Israel. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, this is addressed to Father White, but uh, the R Rabbi uh, Novak is invited to add his comments if he wishes. Um, I just, um, there seems to uh, there seems be a, a kind of discontinuity between the doctrine of the church before Vatican II and since Vatican II. I'm just going to... What is it? Yes, What's I would like to... the doctrine to, of the church on Judaism before Vatican II? Yes, yes. It, according to this, okay, I have the uh, Congregation of the Holy Office Decree Cum Supreme speaks of the Jewish people as depositories of the divine promises up until the arrival of Jesus Christ. Also, it speaks of them as a people once chosen by God, right? And then the other point is this, is a covenant, it's, di it's different to say that the Jewish people are beloved of God for the sake of the prophets, and that there is still is a covenantal, ongoing, intense relationship of religious belief and practice. Let me just add, in Mestici Corporis, uh, Pius XII teaches that with the, sa with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the rending of the temple veil, that the, the sacraments, ceremonies, and sacramentals of the old law wholly ceased, but moreover, they were not only ceased, they became dead and bearers of death, yeah. such that anybody who, anybody who knowingly, right, he, despite being illuminated by God, about the truth of the Catholic faith continues to practice. And then a third point would be this, is that the new uh, prayer for, at, at Good Friday is different from the old prayer. The old prayer for the, spoke explicitly of praying for the conversion of the Jews, that the veil might be lifted from their eyes and that they confess Christ, whereas the new prayer says just simply that they continue in faithfulness to their covenant. So th those two to me seems to be contradictions. How can there be a covenant if the sacraments of that covenant are dead and bearers of death? Yeah, okay. I mean, I think though there are lots of, there's a lot there, and I think there are, those are exactly the kinds of topics that have to be treated in a responsible Catholic theology of Judaism. I think there's differences in some of them. I mean, as for the doctrinal teachings, you can find some statements, say, for example, at Florence and so forth on the Jews and on culpability for rejection in Christ, but there isn't a lot, and when you interpret it, uh, you have little pieces. I don't, I don't believe there's a substantive, I do not believe, and we'd have to look through the Dinzinger and work it all out, but I don't think there's a substantive development of doctrine, of teaching about the Jews in the, when I say doctrine, I mean official dogmatic teaching of the church at the highest level that undergoes a substantive revision at Vatican II. And if there were, then the problem would be with Vatican II. But I don't think there is. Okay, so, because I mean, the church can't change her doctrine. So we'd have to look at how there are aspects and nuances. I don't see the problem there, but we could, you know, I, I could refer you to articles that I think deal with this material, you know, responsibly. I also don't think the change in the prayers is effectively especially important because I still, you can find very strong instances of the church praying post Vatican II for the plenary illumination of the Jewish people. It's said in a much gentler way, the tone is different. But the idea of fulfillment theology of illumination of the Jews seems to me still be in the liturgy myself. Um, I do agree with you that the teaching of the works of the old law, the sac I mean, I said in the paper that there is there supersessionism in the Catholic tradition. And actually, I upheld it. I mean, I do think that the Catholic Church cannot get around the idea that the new, uh, the, the, the sacraments of the New Testament supersede and in a certain sense are claimed to fulfill and replace those of the Old Testament. It seems to be crazy to deny that because otherwise we would circumcise little, little Catholic children and they wouldn't be, we wouldn't baptize them. But we do baptize them. So it seems to me we are supersessionists in practice, whatever we say in theory. So we should acknowledge that. But that doesn't, then you've got the, end, the adjacent question 
of whether, and it's true what you say, the traditions since say they've now become deadly and death dealing. And I think that there, the church has to hold on to some theory of that. That, that I think is still totally unresolved and di heavily disputed by contemporary Catholic theologians, including many who are very friendly to the Jewish people, about what we consider the objective status of the sacraments of the old law after the coming of Christ. But we have complemented that with a strong insistence on the subjective sincerity of the Jewish people and the role that grace can play in people. I mean, we also believe, for example, that Protestants hold the errors, but we also think that grace can be at work in the lives of Protestants. Both those things are true. Protestantism transmits errors, and grace can be at work in Protestants who are in error. You know, so I mean, there's, there's, here's where there are developmental questions in the church's doctrine, but I don't think there are catastrophic um, or really logical, deep logical inconsistencies that are unnegotiable before and after the Second Vatican Council. Now that gets into deeper questions about how much the, the council ruptures with the past, but I, I see it as much more one of continuity and development. But does conscience constitute a covenant? Does, does the working of God in the individual conscience well, you asked a good, constitute you asked a, a covenant? You asked a great question, which is how can you have an embodied religion in and through those practices that constitutes still, that contributes in some way still to the covenant? I would, I would uh, refer you to a very good article by Cardinal Avery Dulles written in First Things. Uh, you'd have to search... A Avery Dulles in Israel, I can't remember the title of this important article, where he, he treats some of this question about the nuances of how to hold that the Jewish people can, can be still living in some relationship with God, and grace might be at work in their life with God, even while they do hold to the practices that in some way belie the truth of the fulfillment of the old covenant sacrifices in the coming of Christ. But I do think we believe something like that. I don't think we can just say, well, the Old Testament sacrifices and the New Testament sacraments are on the same level. They're just two different ways to God. I don't see that as an option for Catholics in light of the reality of Christ. But I don't think that means we have to reject the, that grace can be at work in the life of the Jewish people. That's why the church has moved to the language of fulfillment theology. Thank you very much, Rabbi and uh, Father. So it is my honor to talk about, to talk to two holy men at the same time. So my question is very simple. So is there any way to, recon to reconcile the Christian ecastology and the Jewish ecastology? As we heard, so Christ is the, is the Messiah, and he came once and, uh, to trans transform part of us, and he will come again in the future again to transform the world entirely. And for the Jews, as I heard, so the Messiah has not came yet, has not come yet. So I think it's a very open question. I wanted to hear something from, from you. Well, I mean, you know, it, 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 to say, well, you know, Christians think that the Messiah came and Jews think uh, the Messiah is yet to come. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the Messianic hope, the hope for the coming of the Messiah, is something which is a regular feature of Jewish liturgy and statement. Uh, in fact, I, I, I as a rabbi, uh, uh, I don't preach that often anymore because I'm not functioning in, in a congregation, but when I do, I always end with a statement of Amen. May the, the, the Messiah, our righteous Messiah, may he come speedily in our day, say, Amen. Uh, Christians speak of the parousia, the, 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 the return of Christ. So therefore, Jews do not, are not just settled, well, let's just settle for this world and whatever. We are still very much anticipate uh, what I call, uh, you know, and look, for, look towards a, a, a very high eschatological horizon. Uh, but Christians, certainly, it's not, I mean, this was one, I think, of the uh, errors, if you will, of a time of Christian supersessionalism uh, of, of, at times of the high Middle Ages that's, that basically, look, you know, everybody's, you know, it's just a question of Christianizing the world and why are the Jews holding out, you know, and, and once we do that, this is what Jews called, and there's, there are parallels in Christian theology of Dukkha, it's forcing the end. God will, if, in other words, our 
actions in this world, our sacramental actions, if you will, are not from the past, the present, and automatically going into the future. The final redemption seems to be that the future will invade the present. Uh, and that will be God's choice. And that human beings uh, have to be very careful uh, in attempting to fast forward uh, 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 this sort of thing. So, so therefore, it, it's, it's the same thing, it's the error of saying, well, Jews are fixated on, 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 on the Old uh, Testament and Christians have gone beyond. The fact is, is that the Talmudic tradition is basically, in some ways, the Jewish version of the New Testament, in some ways. They're, they're both midrashim, they're both interpretations, and there's no statement, as I said, in the New Testament that's not based on, on the Hebrew Bible. So that is the question. But attempt to force this by a, a, what could be only considered to be a syncretism, kind of let's all come together and whatever, is usurping the transcendence of God as the Redeemer. Uh, and therefore, this is the case, that's why in this, in this world, we cannot either become relativists or syncretists. Relative, you know, you have yours and I have give up our truth claims. Or, on the other hand, claim that everything we're saying is the same. Uh, and that's the tension in which we live. I, I agree with that. I would just add, though, that, um, I mean, I agree with that. And, but it's important to note from the Catholic point of view that the Catechism of the Catholic Church from 1994, while agreeing completely with what you were saying, that Christians believe the Messiah has come, also emphasizes that there's the definitive coming of the glorified Christ in the end times, and the church says that the Jewish people with the Catholic Church await the definitive coming of the Messiah. So in other words, the Catholic Church recognizes that in Israel's prolonged existence, that God maintains the people of Israel down through time and that she still awaits the Messiah, shows that there is a certain shared weight that the church holds to and welcomes from the Jews that they await the, enlight the final enlightenment and coming of the Messiah. And the church waits with them in some sense. There, in other words, the Catholic Church intimates there in the Catechism there's some kind of shared waiting for the Messiah or expectation, despite the fact that we claim that we know who he is because he's already come and is now coming again in glory. Thank you. Oh, uh, f first and foremost, thank you for speaking today. And uh, my question was, uh, what do you think of uh, the growing number of Messianic Jews that bridge both faiths and follow Jewish custom but claim to redeem salvation to Christ? What, what do I think of, uh, uh, of Messianic Jews? Um, I think that they are a problem for both communities. Uh, the fact is that it was quite clear that in the early days of the church there was considered to be a heresy or a quasi heresy called Judaization. That was either Jews who converted to Christianity were still practicing Judaism, or some even Gentile Christians somehow became enamored of Jewish practices. Uh, on the Jewish side, it was clear that it came to a point where they said that Gentiles should not be practicing Jewish practices. If they want to practice Jewish practices, let them totally convert to, uh, uh, to Judaism. So I think that it, that it is a, uh, a problem. These people are, are, are still part of the Jewish people because, they, because of divine election, which is indelible. Uh, but they are practicing something which is um, neither Judaism nor Christianity, as far as I can see. Uh, and that becomes a uh, problem. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Father Thomas Joseph mentioned the late uh, Cardinal Avery Dulles, who uh, I, I knew quite well, and um, uh, I remember having a conversation with him, uh, and he said that clearly, I mean, uh, and there's basis in, 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 in other church cities and Aquinas as well, uh, that, uh, uh, that once a person is a Christian, they should not be practicing Jewish practices, at least not as sacraments. So that therefore, uh, I mean, I think that, for example, uh, that uh, it's, uh, I used to be asked as a rabbi, can I invite a Christian friend to the Passover Seder? I said, yeah, why not? I mean, they, they, because Gentiles couldn't eat the Paschal Lamb, but we don't have the Paschal Lamb, at least with the temple being destroyed. Uh, I said, yeah, 
I mean, ra rather than a, than, than a Christian somehow or other regarding a Jewish practice and, and giving it a Christian spin, uh, is that uh, I've had it, that uh, uh, a Christian friend, invite, invite him to our Passover Seder, and they're welcome guests and whatever, uh, but they're not practicing some kind of syncretism that's Jewish and Christian. They're, they're, they're clearly there, and it does not have sacramental status for them, even though they're very, very respectful. In the same way that if I uh, have been, let's say, to a, to, a, to a Catholic service or especially like, like a Catholic funeral, uh, I very much respect what is going on. I behave in a respectful way, but I cannot certainly participate uh, in the ritual. It would be disingenuous of me to do so. So I think that, uh, that I think that there's the specter of syncretism which is a temptation, but it's, 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 it's a temptation. And, and, and the greatest example of that, the greatest example of the one who recognized that was the most famous Jewish convert to Christianity, Edith Stein. Edith Stein understood why the Jews could not accept her conversion. She understood that very well. Unlike certain Messianic Jews. I remember that after Edith Stein was canonized, I got a number of invitations to speak at uh, a, a number of Catholic colleges of a very conservative nature. And I found that there were several groups of people that were reappearing at every thing. There were Catholics there who were happy that I wasn't bashing the Catholic Church. My argument was basically is that the Catholic Church, if Edith Stein joined the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church wants to canonize her, that is the Catholic Church's business to, to memorialize their own dead. Uh, then there were Jews who came who were angry that I wasn't bashing the Catholic Church, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. And then there were some Messianic Jews who came who couldn't understand why you can't be both. And what I would tell them is Edith Stein understood that. Covenantal religions are interesting. You can check in, but you can't check out. And you can't change your address, at least in de jure, in, in, a, in a high metaphysical uh, 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 type of sense. So I think that that is an easy head. That'll really solve the problem. You know, let's have people who are both Jewish and Christian. Uh, I, don't th I think that from the perspective of both traditions, it doesn't work. Thanks, it's hard to be last, but uh, I would like, uh, what I'm grateful for for both presentations are the definitions and the distinctions that happen today. It's something that, that I can benefit from and my students can benefit from. And what I would like to ask is for an explanation of a term that, that we didn't encounter today, that, but we might encounter in future explorations of this topic. And the term is dispensationalism or dispensation or dispensationalist. Can you tell us what that means in relationship to what's been discussed today? What do what I do you need to think know in my students? Because that's typically a Protestant word. And I yeah. don't mean that by that it's useless. I just mean that I would like to hear what you think it means. Well, I, I, what I understand it to mean, okay, is that uh, it's, I, I know it to be used in a Protestant context. And I know it to come up with something having to do with uh, Protestant and Jewish, uh, I don't know, activities in the Holy Land. I don't know particularly what. I think it's millenarian in some respect, but I don't know. So what I'm here doing is I'm seeking clarification as to what that might mean and how that pertains to this conversation. Listen, my understanding of it, and it's, it's very imperfect, David maybe knows better, is that it's a, it's a very important category that has many different interpretations in modern reformed thinking about ages of history. But when you talk about like there's the dispensation of the time of Israel prior to the coming of Christ and after Christ the dispensation of the time of the church prior to the final coming of Christ, the eschaton. But there can also be dispensations within history where there are you know, new inaugurations of God's work. And so then the question becomes, uh, are there specific contemporary Reformed theologies, typically Reformed or Baptist theologies, often in America, about the, the place of the state of Israel as having a role in sacred history for Christians? Now, I think the Catholic Church has rather carefully avoided committing to anything like that. That doesn't mean that the Church has committed to saying that the, the, the state of Israel has necessarily has no role in the divine economy. 
Mm-hmm. But the church has been very careful to distinguish her dialogue with the Jewish people and her thinking about the ongoing reality and mystery of the covenant of God with both the church and the Jews from particular questions about the political state of Israel. John Paul II walked a very fine line here by saying that he, he affirmed, if I recall correctly, the idea that the church, the church recognizes the moral and, you might say, natural right of the Jewish people to live in some organized, self-organized way, free from aggression and extermination, in, and, in a kind of autonomous way, and that it is therefore fitting for historical reasons they ought to do so in the land that belonged to their ancestors. And, and so he argued for, as it were, a kind of a civic natural law argument for the respect of the state of Israel, with a two-state solution vis-a-vis the Palestinians. And that has remained sort of the normative diplomatic stance of the Holy See. But I emphasize diplomatic because it's not a doctrinal stance that's Mm. been elaborated. There are theologies of the state of Israel written by eminent theologians like Charles Journet and Jacques Maritain. They were never canonized or, you know, elevated to the level of official church teaching. And that remains, I think, uh, an interesting question of how uh, the Catholic Church is, should, and can, can think about the, the place of Israel in the ongoing uh, history of the Jewish people and the church's relationship with the Jewish people. Uh, or if, okay, if that's what you mean by dispensationalism, I would, I, I would say the following. Um, one of the, um, in terms of the state of Israel, the state of Israel is, is was primarily the, the, the achievement of the Zionist movement. Um, there have always been two forms of Zionism, a, a secular Zionism and a religious Zionism. Secular Zionism, uh, many kinds said it had a Marxist flavor, decidedly looked upon Zionism as a replacement of Judaism. It was a real replacement, a real supersessionism. Uh, one of the Zionist, early Zionist secularist theorists said, God has no heirs, which means God is dead. Uh, And that was a type of secular Zionism. Uh, Religious Zionism has two forms. One is a very millenarian form, which speaks of the state of Israel as reshit smichat gulatenu, the beginning of our redemption and whatever. Uh, I am of the decidedly non supersessionist version. To me, the state of Israel's religious significance is that the Jewish people are, are now enabled to observe the commandment of the Torah, which says you should settle the land of Israel and build there a uniquely Jewish society. I also think that when looked at traditionally, that there could, in principle, could easily be a Palestinian state. I think there are political reasons where I can't comment because I'm not an Israeli of how mm-hmm. it should come about. I'm not living there. But that it is a, it, it is a, an observance of, a, 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 of, of the commandment to settle the land of Israel. That the redemption that we hope for is not a human achievement. It is not something that is progressive. It will come when God decides it comes. And therefore, the most is that we would like to think that the final redemption will at least begin in, in, in the land of Israel. But it, it, I'm, I'm decidedly separate Messianism from Zionism. And I, my Zionism is a religious Zionism because it's the divine mandate of the Torah of the Jewish people to settle, uh, to, to inherit and settle the land of Israel. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for Uh, sharing your minds, your wisdom, and uh, your dialogue with us uh, this evening. So, um, and thanks to all of you uh, for, for holding out to the end uh, for a great conversation. I would almost say it was a super session. <laughs> uh, um,